honored and we're glad that you've joined us at the beginning of a brand new message series that we're calling Know Thy God. If you've been a Christian long enough and you're living out your Christianity for all to see, Chances are someone at work or at your school may come to you one day and ask you to explain to them who God is. If that should happen, how would you go about explaining God to that person how, how would you go how would you go about explaining God God that was exactly the assignment a third grader what, what grade are you now oh there you go so so it's someone like Sierra a, a, a third grader was given that exactly assignment to explain God. And the assignment was to explain God. So let me read to you what this third grader wrote and see if you are smarter than a third grader. Not a fifth grader, a third grader. The little girl titled her assignment explanating God explanating God here's what she wrote remember she's a third grader here's what she wrote one of God's main job is making people he makes them to replace the ones that die so there will be enough people to take care of things on earth he doesn't make grown-ups just babies I think because they are smaller and easier to make. <laughs> that way, it doesn't have to take up valuable time teaching them to talk and walk. It can just leave that to mothers and fathers. God's second most important job is listening to prayers. An awful lot of this goes on, as you can tell from that amen. Amen. Since some people like preachers and things pray at times beside bedtime. God doesn't have time to listen to the radio or TV because of this. Because he hears everything. There must be a terrible lot of noise in his ears. Unless he has thought of a way to turn it off. God sees everything and hears everything. And it's everywhere which keeps him pretty busy. So, you shouldn't go wasting his time by going over your mom and your dad's head asking for something they said you could not have. Jesus is God's son. He used to do all the hard work like walking on water, and performing miracles and trying to teach people who didn't want to learn about God they finally got tired of him they, they got tired of him preaching to them and they crucified him but he was good and kind like his father and he told his father that they didn't know what they were doing and to forgive them and God said okay is that God appreciated everything that he had done and all his hard work on earth. So he told him he didn't have to go out on the road anymore. He could stay in heaven. So he did. And now he helps his dad out by listening to prayers and seeing things which are important for God to take care of and which ones he can take care of himself without having to bother God. Like a secretary, only more important. <laughs> You can pray anytime you want. And they are sure to help you because they got it worked out 
So one of them is on duty all the time. You should always go to church on Sunday because it makes God happy. If you do something you think will be more fun, like going to the beach, this is wrong. And beside, the sun doesn't come out at the beach until noon anyway. <laughs> if you don't believe in God, besides being an atheist, you will be very lonely. Because your parents can't go everywhere with you, like to camp and stuff, but God can. It is good to know is around you when you're scared in the dark or when you can't swim and you get thrown into the real deep water by the big kids. But you shouldn't just always think of what God can do for you. I figure God put me here and he can take me back anytime he pleases. And that's why I believe in God. The end. Isn't that great? Did, did, that third, did that third grader went to Bible college or what? But I wonder how you who is not a third grader would explain who God is if you were asked. Oh, he is my lily of the valley. He is my rose of Sharon. He is my strength where I've been made weak. He is the strong tower that I can lean on. My rock, my deliverer, my provider, my protector. Oh, he is my shining armor. <laughs> he is my very present help when I'm in need. He is awesome. I wonder, do you know him? I didn't ask you, do you know about him? Because how many of you know it's one thing to know about someone and it's another thing to actually know that person? Oh, oh, oh. how many of you young people, how many of you young people would say you know something about Shakira? Okay. You probably follow her on Twitter. But can you say you know how she brushes her teeth? Whether she goes right to left or left to right? We're talking about intimate stuff here that only the person who knows that person can really tell. So too, church. It's one thing to know about God by reading of him in the Bible. And that's good. But it's another thing to, as the psalmist says in Psalm 34 verse 8, Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see for yourself <laughs> that the Lord is Oh, oh, I know I'm talking to some folk here who have tested who God is. You weren't just singing that awesome God song like you were singing it this morning because you feel like singing. But you know him to be a provider. Huh? You know him to be a deliverer. Huh? You know him to be a protector. Huh? What are you saying, David? What are you saying, David? It's like this. A dish may look good. And I've seen some of you ladies in this church, I've seen you go to work whenever we have them potlucks here. You all can cook. Mm -mm. You can make some brothers eat. And I've seen, you, I've seen some of you bros. I've seen some of you bros in action too. <laughs> but how many of you know a dish may look good by just looking at it? But the proof of how good the dish is is in the eating of the pudding. In our case here at Wema, being a multicultural church, the proof of how good that food is, that dish is, is in the eating of the oxtail <laughs> and the jerk chicken. Can I get a witness? Amen. In the same way, 
we do not actually come to know God. Listen to me. We do not actually come to know God. It may look good until we have tasted the experience of who He is. You can't truly know He's a provider until your landlord comes to you and tells you the rent is due. And ain't got no cash. Ain't got no girl to make you smile. But somehow, the Lord came through for you again. Is there anyone in here who knows what I'm talking about that he is a provider? That you can't say, you can't say truly, you can't say truly that you know God as a comforter. You can't say you know God as a comforter. Until you lose a child. Or you lose a wife. Or you lose a husband. Or a parent. Oh, oh, oh I'm glad I got me some folk in here who knows not just about God, but who knows their God. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Glory to God. So last Sunday, our introduction of this series, we established the fact that when we talk about knowing God, we're not simply referring to an awareness of God. We're not referring, we're not simply referring to an information. So you're just informed. Knowing God is much more deeper than just being informed, you all. And it's much more deeper than just acknowledging that you know God exists. So does the devil. The Bible says the devil believes God exists too. So what makes what you know different from what he knows? That's the question on the floor. Let's find out. Somebody read Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 for us. Daniel eleven thirty-two. 32. What does it say? And such as do wickedly against the covenant mm -hmm. shall he corrupt by flatteries. Mm. But the people mm. that do know their God mm. shall be strong and do exploits. Oh, let, let, let me read that again. Let me read that again, should in case somebody missed it. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. Talking about the devil. But the people hmm. and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But those who know their God shall be strong. I've titled the message this morning Those Who Know Their God. Notice again what Daniel didn't say here. He didn't say the people who know about their God. <laughs> See, that's where we drew, that's where I drew the thesis of this series. He didn't say those who know about their God. Mm -mm. He said, that's not what he said. He said, the people that do know about their God shall be strong. The implication, of course, is some will profess that they know God. When in actuality, they don't know God 
They just know about God like the first group of people in verse 32. But if you know your God, just turn quickly, turn quickly to two people around you. Just turn quickly to two people around you and say, I know my God, I know my God, I know my God. You have to understand my brothers and my sisters. That when the words of this verse was written, Daniel wasn't on the French Riviera vacationing. <laughs> he wasn't sipping pina colada, without rum of course, <laughs> <laughs> on a beach on Waikiki. No, no, he was a hostage in Babylon filled with player haters who were determined to be to take him out player haters were determined to take him out because he refused to be a sellout unto his God so what is this verse saying to us it's saying people who know God not simply people who profess to know God, but those who know their God, even in the midst of a bad situation, even when times are rough and tough, and your haters want you out, this text is saying, you knowing your God is going to be beneficial to you in two ways. Knowing who your God is is going to do you, is going to go, is, is going to benefit you in two ways, regardless of how bad the situation is. Number one, number one benefit. Those who know their God shall be strong. They shall be strong. The word there in verse 32 for strong, Sister Marie, Marie, the word there for strong means to prevail. It, it, it's not talking about somebody who is pumping iron like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's talking about to prevail. The question is to prevail against what? To prevail over what? When Daniel is talking about the people who know their God shall be strong, he is referring to an event. He's referring to a, an historical point. See, you don't come to know God in abstract. God is the God of history. After all, history is history. You really get to know God, who God is, when you give him an opportunity for him to show himself off to you. You don't get to know God on the abstract. You see, Abraham wouldn't have known that God is the provider until he went and took Isaac, his son, to be sacrificed. And then when he's about to do the most audacious, incredulous thing that any father could do to a child, God said, ah, don't do that. Now I know. You don't get to know God in the abstract. You get to know God when you give him an opportunity for him to show himself off to you. You remember what happened to the three Hebrew boys? Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and, and a preacher called the third Hebrew boy a bad Negro. <laughs> he meant a Benigo. You remember what happened to them in, that, in this same book, Daniel chapter 3? King Nebuchadnezzar built this golden image, huge, huge golden image. We're talking about this golden image talk again. <laughs> last week we was, 
Last week it was a golden calf. This week it's a golden image. About 90 feet tall. That's over nine stories tall. If you can't get your thing there, just think of a nine story. This is huge image. And of course, anytime you create an image, you know what you're going to do with it, don't you? And so the king commanded, when the music begins to play, everyone should bow down and worship the statue, probably of himself, and do the Gangnam Dance style. All right, well, how do you do, how do, you do it again? <laughs> bow down and worship and do the Gangnam Stand Dance. Everyone bowed except three. Uh oh. Uh oh. Houston, we got problem. Why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow? Didn't they hear the king's command? No, 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 no. They know their God. Because their God had issued a command first, saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before. And the second command is no image of me because he's so unique you're to make no image of him nor bow down to any image for that matter and God says in his word to those who know him don't make any image of me nor bow down to any image you make with your own hands for that matter because anything you come up with is going to make me look bad in front of people who need to really know me for who I am. Oh, oh, I, 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 I know you didn't leave church last Sunday. We talked about golden calf last Sunday. I know you didn't leave church last Sunday and went home buying before a little man with a round belly sitting in, 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 on your entertainment unit in your living room. But did you this week, did you bow down to the golden image of money did you bow down to the golden image of work or the golden image of of, of a, a, a sexual addiction or that 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 relationship in your life that relationship in your life that you still won't let go so God can be God to you oh we are talking about golden calf and golden image Oh, I won't bother with your golden image this morning. But if you want to know God, and if you want to prevail, if you want to prevail over all the shenanigans and the drama the devil keeps throwing at you, then you got to be willing to stand strong and stand tall, flat-footed for Jesus like these three Hebrew boys did. When everyone else everyone else are trying to be crowd pleasers these Hebrew boys went crowd pleasers we talked about crowd pleasers last week some of you young people went here the text says in verse 12 everyone was bowing even some of the other Jews who were there Remember, there were a lot of Jews that were taken into captivity. The Bible says, everyone bowed except three. That tells me that even some Jews bowed. All but three. It wasn't like they cared. It wasn't like they cared what others did. It wasn't. But, but, you know what gets some of us in big trouble? We care too much about what people think of us. Like, like they'll think we're losers. They'll think we're losers if we stand out. No, the devil is a liar. 
The devil is the loser. I, I heard somebody say, I heard somebody say at 20 years old, at 20 year old, years old, we are still wondering what everybody thinks about us. At 20, we just want to impress everybody. At 40 years old, we don't care what anybody thinks about us. Because at 60 years old, we realize nobody was thinking about us. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how age humbles you. It's amazing how age makes you see a better and different perspective. Because the older you get, oh, oh I'm preaching to our young people right now. Don't you all think you're going to be like this forever? <laughs> because the older you get, the wiser. The older you get, the wiser you, 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 know, you know how you used to think when you were young people, when you were young too. You, you go, my daddy doesn't know anything. Anybody? Uh, my mother is a fuddy daddy. She's just a gr grumpy. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. But now, whoo. Guess who they come running to? Hey, glory to God. You know, the older I get, it is true. The older I get, I live my life by this motto. Put it up, the lifeline. Everyone has a right to the opinion of me. And I have every right not to listen to it. Oh, oh, that's good. That's tweetable. Everyone has a right to their opinion of me. But I have every right not to listen to it. See, that's a good axiom to live your life by too. If what people's opinion, if what people's opinion doesn't match God's opinion of you, if what people's opinion doesn't match God's opinion of you, then let what people say about you go in one ear. Oh, oh, I, I'm teaching somebody how to be strong this morning. I, I'm, I'm helping somebody to be... Who is this message for this morning? Because cause you know some people, no matter how much you try to please them, they still will find some fault about Can I get me a witness? Yeah. It's like the story, it's like the story of, uh, of this grandfather and his grandson who were taking a trip out of town and he started off letting his grandson ride the donkey and he was walking behind. Somebody saw them and said, look at that selfish little boy making this old man walk and the grandfather heard it took the boy off he got on his donkey and he rode it while his grandson was walking behind a few minutes later someone else saw them and said look at that selfish old man making the little boy walk while he's riding that's not right hearing that the grandfather picked up the boy and put him on the back of the donkey. Now they're both riding. They hadn't gone far when somebody else who is an animal activist <laughs> saw them both riding the donkey and he stopped them and said, how cruel of two of you to put that heavy load on that little donkey. <laughs> By the time they got to the town, the grandfather and the grandson were both carrying the donkey. <laughs> you get my point. You get my point. Some people, no matter how hard you try to please them,
no matter what you do, you ain't going to please everyone. Not even yourself. You might as well go ahead and please only God. Because in the long run, it is only him that is worth pleasing anyways. Come on now. I'm teaching someone here how to be strong. The text says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't care what others did not. They didn't care what others did. They didn't even care. It didn't matter to them because they could have gone with the flow. They could have gone with the flow and say, oh, everybody else is doing it. Oh, it won't hurt. It won't hurt if I, if I do it just, just this one time. Really? Not if you know your God. I mean, these Hebrew boys were so strong because they know their God to the extent that when Nebuchadnezzar threatened to throw them in the fiery furnace, if they didn't bow and he asked them, what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? The text says, these Hebrew boys answered the king in verse 16. Let's look at verse 16. He said in verse 16, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. In other words, no disrespect, talk to the hand. No, that's not, that's not exactly what they say. I, that's my interpretation of what they say. But verse 17, If it be so, our God. <laughs> Woo! Hide me from the rain. Lord, help me preach this message like I really know and feel it. Our God, whom we serve, whom we know, is able to deliver us. You ask me, how did they know he's able? They know because they've been studying their Bible and they've heard the story of their ancestors walking through the Red Sea on dry ground. And they figured that, that any God who can make the Red Sea open up can surely take a little water and put out Nebuchadnezzar's fire. Hey! If the God would drown Pharaoh and all his armies, and the God who fell the wall of Jericho and dropped Goliath with a little stone, if that God has not lost his strength, surely that same God can still rescue us. And it's good to know that he's able. O king, verse 18. But even if he does not, <laughs> but even if he does not, they didn't mean by that, Jilela, they didn't mean that by that, that even if he's, he's not able, because they already told us he's able. So when they say, but even if he does not, that doesn't mean they're saying he's not able. But by that they're saying, even if our God chooses to let us burn in your fire, O king, we still will not bow down to your golden image. Lord have mercy. Oh, these guys are talking to the most powerful ruler in all of Babylon. But he wasn't the most powerful ruler in the universe. God is. Come on, only a knowledge, only a knowledge of who God is can produce that kind of strength and confidence in front of a red hot blazing fire. 
If you don't know God and you don't have that, you don't have a confidence, you can't stand before your boss and say, You can fire me if you want. <laughs> you know the rest of the story. King Nebu threw them in the fiery furnace. And in verse 24 and 25, he looked and saw three. He, 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 he looked and saw four men. In verse 25, he saw four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. And he asked his men, was it not three? Verse 24, was it not three men we threw in the fire? Who, who is that fourth man in the fire? Who looks like the son of the gods? Somebody shout that's Jesus. Jesus. I say shout that's Jesus. Jesus. Oh, preacher, preacher, how do you know that's Jesus? For I hear the Bible say, my Bible say in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. <laughs> and through the rivers, <laughs> they will not overflow you. <laughs> when you walk through the what? Fire. Lord, let me preach this message. When you walk through the what? It will not scorch you. Verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Meaning, he will be the fourth man in the fire with you. Somebody going through the fire right now. Somebody, you're going through the fire this morning. I stopped by to tell you, just as God didn't protect these Hebrew boys from the fire, but he protected them in the fire. God will show up for you too. For Paul says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3, chapter 10 verse 13, Paul says, No temptation has seized upon you except which is common to men. And God is faithful. Meaning, he is able. <laughs> He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, it would also provide a way out. So that you can stand up. The Bible says, the three Hebrew boys stood strong. And having done all, they came out. Verse 27. They came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> Somebody here, on this first Sunday of Spring Forward, I see you coming out too. And I see you coming out, and you don't look like what you've been either. <laughs> if that prophecy is for you, give the Lord your victory praise right now. 30 second victory praise. I'm coming out. I'm not going to look like what I used to look like. It's a new me, it's a new day. It's a new dawning. It's springtime in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, glory. I feel the power of God in this place. Oh, he said, call those things that are not as though they were. Mm. You're watching us on WHBC TV and you're going, why are these people so excited? Because we know our God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me say something to you. This is addendum. This is, this is just sidebar. Whenever you see us worshiping God and praising God, please understand, it doesn't mean we haven't come through the valley. 
Some of us are still in the valley. But we sang that song. You're with me in the valley. And he's hiding us from the rain. And so when we're praising God, and maybe you're still in the valley, let me tell you this. Don't feel bad that the person next to you is praising God. Let their praise help you get out of your valley. Hey! Because there's something, when the Bible says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. You may not be where I am, but when I'm magnifying him, and you're seeing him, oh, just as he is, he will bring you to the level where you need to be. I, I, am I talking Bible talk here? So, so, so there might be times when you come to church and you're down and we're saying praise the Lord. That's all right. But my prayer is as the praises goes up, the blessing will come down on you. Amen. Glory to God. Let, let me quickly give you the second benefit that knowing God will do for you. Even when your enemies are out to get you. Is this message up in anybody? All right. Number two. Number two benefit. Those who know their God shall do exploits. They shall do exploits. When Daniel says, in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, when Daniel says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. The word exploits there doesn't mean taking advantage of someone unfairly. Like we would use the word today. Exploited me. Like, like, like child exploitation. No, no, no. Exploit here means to display a daring feat. It means doing things that people said can't be done. It means taking action. Oh, somebody here knows what I'm talking about. People say you'll never get married again. <laughs> no one would ever love you again. But praise God like Ruth. Praise God like Ruth. <laughs> you pit it up yourself again, girl. <laughs> and you put on your garment of praise. <laughs> In the place of your spirit of heaviness. <laughs> if they can only see you now in your Boha's arms. Amen. Folks say you'll never be able to go back to school and get that degree. Now, you're not only graduated, but you got a job too. Glory to God. Because you know your God. And you also know that the people who know their God shall be strong and do the things that folks say can't be done. Hello, somebody. In Daniel chapter 6, we see Daniel displaying a daring feat. Once again, Daniel's player haters connived with the king to issue a decree that no one was to pray to any god except the king himself. Anyone found praying to his God will be thrown in the lion's den. Well, you know the story. Daniel said, bring it on. He knows his God. He knew that he cannot not pray to his Jehovah God. That's all his God in a foreign land. Where there's no mother, where there's no father, that's all he's got. He's God. And you're telling him not to talk to that God? So the Bible says, Daniel went to prayer. Like he would usually do. But meanwhile, his player haters set up a surveillance camera to spy on him. Oh, they, they had I spy back then too. <laughs> So they snitched on him to the king. 
And the king asked Daniel, verse 16 of chapter 6 of Daniel, Let's see, is your God whom you constantly serve able to deliver you? Jude chapter 24 says, He is able to keep us from falling. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, He is able to save you completely to the uttermost. So much so, one preacher said, that means he saved me from the godmost <laughs> to the uttermost. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3.20 says, He is able to do exceedingly. So Daniel was thrown in the lion's den alive. Alive. But the Bible says, the next morning, the king came, verse 20, and called out, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God been able to deliver you from the lions? Verse 21, then Daniel spoke. Good morning! <laughs> Oh, king, live forever. In other words, king, don't have a heart attack. I'm still here. <laughs> you mean the lion didn't have Daniel for supper? Keep reading. Verse 22. Don't stop now. Don't stop now. Tell your neighbor, there's, wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Verse 22. Keep reading. Uh, wait, there's more. My God sent. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth in other words king my god is the deliverer yeah. oh king darius he delivered my three hebrew bros <laughs> shadrach meshach and abednego from your daddy once when he threw them in the fiery furnace and i know if he did it once Surely he can do it again and again and again and again. He said he has come to shut the mouth of the lions for me. I don't know who this message is for, but somebody here, the lions are after you to get you. And when you can't get out of what you've been thrown into, I have a word for you. God will get you out. Come hell or high water. Only believe, only trust and obey, for there's no other way but to be. Oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can. No, 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 no door, no door can block him from coming to you. No wall can keep him out from taking you through whatever you're going through right now. I'm wondering, is there anybody in here ready to do exploit? For God in this year of glory, where are all my kingdom explorers? Where are all my kingdom explorers here this morning? Then I dare you, I double dog dare you to get to know thy God like Daniel. I doggy dog dare you to get to know who God is like these three evil boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Because those who know their God shall be strong and do exploit.